It's great to hear from some of the people that are involved in our uh, different aspects of our worship ministry here and sometimes from behind the scenes and hear the perspective they're bringing to it. And I didn't watch that video ahead of time, but there's some themes and stuff that will come out of that um, as I go along. I'm sure he was crying because it was dark, not because of, yeah, the scary people on screen, right? (laughs) Um, Would you guys uh, just bow your heads in prayer with me really quick? Um, God, I just pray that my words would be uh, your words, that and that uh, we would all have hearts to receive um, what you would say to us this morning um, as we worship you and everything that we do in this service. That's our primary goal, and so with the words that I say, uh, I pray that they would bring you glory first and foremost, and that out of that, um, that we would be changed um, how you would have us be changed. So I pray that we would be receptive to that and that you would get the glory here today, and may I be clear um, and focus as I do that. Amen. In the Gospels, there's a story uh, where Jesus takes a few of his disciples up onto a mountaintop, um, and they get to the mountaintop, and in the blink of an eye, Jesus is changed, transformed. Uh, the Bible says transfigured. Um, suddenly he's like shining, and, and they see Jesus in all of his glory. They see Jesus as he will be when, when he uh, rises again and ascends to heaven. They see Jesus as we will see Jesus face to face one day. No mere man, but just like the Son of God in every sense. And they see this vision, and then in a moment, the vision passes. Jesus is back to normal, standing in front of them, just a guy, and they go back down the mountain, back to everyday life with Jesus. This is a quintessential, what we call, mountaintop experience. This moment of kind of intense, uh, transcendent, spiritual revelation, where you will, if you will, where, where we see God for a minute as he truly is, where we're drawn into wonder and awe and just get a different view on things. It's kind of this special, singular, sacred moment. Um, people throughout history have, have, have used the mountaintop experience metaphor to describe that. It's not the everyday. It's not our normal life with God. But every so often, whether it's in a worship service or another place, we'll have these kind of breakthrough moments where we just see God in a new light, a mountaintop experience. Today's sermon is about corporate worship, what we're doing here as a body of believers uh, gathered together. Uh, And I want to suggest to you that in many ways, corporate worship, coming together like this on Sunday mornings primarily, uh, is like, or ought to be like, a mountaintop experience. And I'll explain what I mean as we go along. Last week, Terry talked about worship, which is very simply this idea of ascribing worth to God, right? And he talked about how it's not a Sunday thing, it's an all-week thing. You know, we hear worship and we associate it immediately with singing especially, but also with just what we're doing on a Sunday morning. He says, no, it's like, it's, it's all of life. In all of life, how I treat my wife, uh, how I drive on the highway, how I wash my dishes, I can bring glory to God in some way. I can bring a worshipful attitude to that. And in many ways, uh, how we worship throughout the week prepares us, sets us up then for Sunday morning, is what he said, which was an awesome point. And I want to say today, I want to reverse that order and say also, what happens on a Sunday morning, what happens in these special event moments can set us up for the rest of the week. Worshiping on the mountain, so to speak, prepares us for a life of worship in the valley, just like what the disciples saw that day changed them and prepared them for what was coming, which was Jesus' imminent death. So I'm going to roll through the reasons why we believe Sunday worship is so important, uh, why we do this. Uh, This sermon for me started with a question. Why do we put so much emphasis on Sunday morning worship? Uh, The idea of everyday worship, doing it in the the little things and just focusing on God with everything I have, uh, that's clicked with me for a long time. It made a lot of sense. And the question that I had after a sermon like Terry's was, okay, well then why all the hubbub? Why does the church continue to focus their life around Sunday morning worship? And this sermon is my attempt to answer that question for myself. And I hope those answers are helpful for you. If not, I'll be over here after the service and you can... Give me your scorecards. Um, as we do this, as we consider uh, these reasons that corporate worship is valuable and important for the life of a Christian, we're going to walk through a series of literal mountaintop experiences in the biblical story uh, to look at those. So the first and most important reason that we gather together to worship corporately is to make a big deal of God. And it'll become clear why I worded it in that way. 
We want to bring glory to God, but specifically we want to make a big deal about God. So there's this crazy story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. Um, The nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel exists still, but it's in steep decline. Uh, They've given themselves over completely to just worshiping false gods, specifically this one called Baal, just doing their own thing. Uh, And it seems like there's just one person that still is on the right track, that still speaks for God, this prophet Elijah. He speaks for God, specifically he calls out everyone around him for their constant idolatry, and especially the king. But you get the sense that he's like the solitary voice. So what Elijah does is he challenges the prophets of this false god Baal to a type of worship duel, basically. He says, catch me outside uh, at Mount Carmel, and we're going to settle this. I shouldn't have gone for that reference. Um, And I'll offer a sacrifice to my God. You offer a sacrifice to your God. And we'll see who responds. We'll see, like, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. Uh, The responses that our gods give us will show everybody who the real God is, right? So Elijah, hundreds of these prophets, the king of Israel himself, uh, the whole nation of Israel, they gathered to Mount Carmel for this duel. And the prophets of Baal spend all day praying out to Baal, dancing, doing all these different rituals. They go all day. Halfway through, they're like, this isn't working. We got to do more. And it gets crazier. And you can read it for yourself in 1 Kings 18. I'm not going to read it here. Um, and at the end of all of this, just there's crickets. And Elijah's standing off to the side saying, like, maybe he went off to use the restroom. You know, maybe keep going. He'll be back, right? Uh, just mocking them. Then it's Elijah's turn. And he prepares a pyre with a sacrifice on. He puts a bull on some wood. And he has some people come and pour buckets of water over the sacrifice just to kind of be a jerk to the prophets of Baal, you know. And then he says, you know what, do it a second time. And they pour more water on it. And he says, do it a third time. And they pour more water on it. He's just showing off. And then Elijah prays shortly and simply. And this is what he says. He says, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. Answer me. So these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. And immediately fire falls from heaven, devours the offering, devours the pyre and every ounce of water. And the people watching fall on their faces. They fall down in worship and they all repeat, the Lord, Yahweh, he is God, apparently. Corporate worship seeks to make a big deal of God, make a public spectacle. And maybe it's a pillar of fire, maybe it's jubilant music or loud drums, maybe in some ways more powerfully in this story, it's one man boldly professing faith in the sight of people that don't have any. Corporate worship magnifies, it multiplies the praises we give. There's something important about doing it in this way. You know, even as we live this lifestyle of worship day by day, there's a time and place for going up on the mountaintop, joining others, and just like making a big deal of it, right? Making a fuss. And, and, and mountaintop worship in this way, isn't, it's not worth more than the worship we do from day to day. God values just as much our our little quiet moments of faithfulness, the little ways in which we worship God and show him what he's worth in front of our friends, at school, at our jobs, whatever. God values that just as much. But this is, uh, you know, it's it's not better, but it's bigger, (laughs) and it's louder, and there's a place for that. The Bible, when it talks about worship, it tells us that there will come a day where the trees of the fields themselves will clap their hands. It says the stars in the sky sing his praises. And when he commands us to worship, it's generally with drums and trumpets and and new songs and dancing, wild dancing. Worship in the Bible is often fun and loud and extravagant. And for the ancient Israelites, it made a ton of sense that when we're worshiping this God, who's worth everything we have, that there are times where we get together and we do it big. They would feast for weeks at a time. So, the first and primary reason that we come together to worship God corporately alongside our lifestyle of everyday worship is to bring glory to God and to make it a public spectacle in some sense. To make it a big deal. God's worth that. And then the next three reasons kind of flow out of that. Honestly, that's the main one. That's the the, worship is for God. It's not for us and what we get out of it. We come focused on God and we think He's worth our best and sometimes our biggest. 
But the, there, there are three other things that happen when we come together to worship that kind of flow out of that, kind of side effects of this worship of God. And, and the first one is this. Uh, when we come together to worship God, we encounter God. So the next mountain we're going to look at is Mount Zion. In the Old Testament, Mount Zion was kind of this place where you would meet God. Uh, originally, it referred to a, a specific kind of hillside in Jerusalem. Eventually, it became synonymous with the whole city of Jerusalem and especially with the temple. And the temple was where God's presence was thought to dwell. God is everywhere all the time, but his presence resided at Mount Zion in a special way. So over and over throughout the Psalms, Mount Zion is described as God's dwelling place, his home. It's where you encountered God's presence in a special way. But then Jesus comes, and Jesus says to the Israelites, now the presence of God is right here. It has come out from Zion. It has come to you. I am in your midst now. And then he prophesies that the temple itself will soon be destroyed, which it is about 35 years later, but that his spirit his presence would dwell with the body of believers. In a letter to the early church, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God, Mount Zion, and that the Spirit of God lives in you. God will destroy anyone who destroys the temple, for God's temple is holy and you are holy. Let me pause here for a second and get up on a soapbox. It would kind of be a good idea for me to just preach from a soapbox the whole time, right, height-wise, but I'll think about that. We need to start using the word y'all more, okay? This is my soapbox. I've, I, I, I'll preach y'all sometimes, and people make comments to me and make fun of me. Well, you're wrong, not me, okay? We have to use y'all more. So Paul wrote this in Greek, right? And in Greek, as in most other languages that make sense, uh, they have a second-person plural. They have a word that, that means you all. We just have you, and you can be singular, you can mean everybody. So when he writes this, he says, the Spirit of God lives in y'all, right? All of you together are the temple of God, the dwelling place of the Spirit. So we have to start getting y'all into English Bible translations, okay? I'm starting the petition. I'll pass it around after the service. Got to get it in there. God who is present everywhere all the time and present with you as an individual when you're praying on your own at home, is pre hear me on this. This is hard to take sometimes, but it's biblically true. He is present with the gathered body of believers in a special way. He's present with all of us, but when we're together, he is present with y'all in a special way. No wonder Jesus says where two or three are gathered as my followers, I am there among them. That's not just something nice sounding. That's like, it's true. Okay? We are the temple of the living God. Have you experienced that to be true? Have you ever been in a body of believers, whether it's in a worship service here, elsewhere, where you felt and experienced the presence of God in a different way, in a special way? I have. It's why I'm here. I went to church my whole life, and I came here, and I experienced something real. And, and to this day, it's what gives me reassurance. If you ask me, Ryan, how can you know any of this is real? How can you be so sure of what you're preaching? The first thing I would point to is my experience of God in the presence of other believers. I don't think that's a cop-out to say that because the Bible tells us and promises us that that is true. He's here with us in a special way. So Sunday worship, as with any other time we gather, we are metaphorically climbing Mount Zion together. Not just hoping, but trusting that we will encounter God. The next side effect of corporately worshiping God, when we bring glory to God, that the other thing that happens is that we are formed by God. So in the book of Exodus, soon after the Israelites leave Egypt, God leads them to the foot of this place called Mount Sinai, right? And Moses kind of climbs the, the mountain on his own and speaks to God, and uh, God says to deliver these words to the people. And this is part of what he says. He says, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. And then the Lord descends upon this mountain. And you'll have to pretend you can actually see that picture. <laughs> but there's, I promise you there's some Israelites down here. Uh, the Lord 
declares this, if you keep my covenant, you will be my people. He descends upon this mountain. And we read in Exodus 19 that there's fire and the ground is shaking and there's lightning and there's a loud trumpet blast. And it says that the people come to the foot of the mountain and they make their stand is the word that's used. They make their stand at the foot of the mountain because it's no small thing to make a covenant with the living God, to make a covenant with that God. And from this tempest of fire and thunder and rumbling, God delivers the Ten Commandments and many other laws, saying that in keeping these laws, you will be formed into a people that represent me in the world well. So imagine making your stand at the foot of that mountain. And as you hear the voice of the Ten Commandments, these familiar words that we read on a page and it's just so sterile and bland, it's just sitting there. Imagine hearing those words and as you hear his voice bellowing these commands, the ground is rumbling beneath your feet. And as you hear those words, you can feel the heat of the fire on your face. Wouldn't we hear that a little differently? It wouldn't be, oh, some enlightening teaching to make me a better person at my job. Like, no, I am at risk of being remade here, being formed, being chained, being done over. This is, this is deeper than, as we worship, we make our stand at this mountain, we hope and expect to be formed by God through messages, through the singing, through communion, through, through every part of what we do here. As we worship, as we encounter this God of fire and thunder, we expect to be changed. And I know that some of us come to corporate worship wanting to learn more about God. Or some people um, use the language of just wanting to be fed. And I hope that both of those things happen, learning and being fed spiritually. Uh, but, but, but formation is deeper than that, okay? It's fundamental change from the inside out. And it's not just you being changed, it's y'all being changed and y'all being formed into the body together. We gotta start using y'all more around here, okay? It'll change our perspective, I'm not kidding. It's bigger than just learning and being fed. And let me just tell you straight up. If the only reason that you came to Sunday worship was to learn more about God. If that was the only reason, I have some great YouTube preachers that I can recommend to you that can do it better than I can. That is not the only reason we come here. We don't come to download head knowledge. That's part of it, and and in that, we know that the truth will change us. We come together to worship knowing that we will be formed. We come together to be formed together. We're all literate. We all have books. We all have the internet. We can learn things in so many different contexts. But here, when we gather together, what we're doing is we are proclaiming the gospel. We're proclaiming the truth of God and who he is. We're bringing him glory full stop. Out of that, Lord willing, we will be formed and we will be changed. But it's so much deeper than learning stuff. It would be formed into his church, into us together. I'm not just some guy preaching, and you're not just some faceless Christians. We are a body together. (laughs) That's why it's worth hearing me, worth hearing Terry, worth hearing Ted preach, and not Joe Schmo on YouTube. (laughs) Because God's doing something in us, specifically here in 2020. And we come together to be a part of that, to be formed. The fourth reason we come together, the last kind of outflow of worshiping God is that we are encouraged by him. Either directly in these corporate gatherings or maybe, um, you know, through, kind of indirectly through each other, we find encouragement. So in the last week of Jesus' life, he spends every day teaching in the temple. And each night, this is crazy to me, he teaches all day in the temple and each night he goes out to this place called the Mount of Olives and he spends the night there. Who knows if he's sleeping or what? And then he would get up at dawn and he'd go back to the temple and there would be crowds waiting for him to hear him teach again. By the way, these crowds a couple days later would be demanding his death. And he knows that. So on the last night before his death, Jesus goes one last time to the Mount of Olives, this place outside the city. He goes there with his disciples and he directs them to to pray. Don't give in to temptation. And then he goes off on his own and he prays this to God. He says, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. 
Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. And even with that angel appearing, we go on to read that Jesus was in agony, that he was sweating blood as he prayed, wrestling with what was about to happen to him. In his darkest hour, facing a brutal death, Jesus, our perfect Savior, was beside himself with agony. And in that moment, he retreats to this special place. He comes to this mountain, and he seeks the company of his disciples. He seeks the consolation and encouragement of God before descending one final time into the valley of the shadow of death to face what's coming to him. That's where he wanted to be in his final moments. And I know it's a similar feeling for many of us when we come here this morning. Hopefully not to this degree of intensity. But a lot of us are coming to Sundays just beaten down, right? Dejected. There's so much darkness and terrible things going on in our lives right now. And we so often come from that place of just like whatever we're walking through in life is just heavy. And we're just desperate to hear anything encouraging. We're just desperate for any word of encouragement, any glimpse of God's glory. Guys, the stuff that I hear and deal with on a weekly basis, there are those times where you come here into worship and and you just need to hear anything. Those times where you yourself can't even bring yourself to sing or look up or stand up just to hear other people singing, to know that there are others coming in from this cold world and like seeking something that are still believing. In the midst of all of that, believing in who God is, even when we don't know it, and, and, and when we're sitting beside him and saying, I'm glad you feel this, and I'm glad you trust this, because I can't right now. That's the encouragement we have to be had when we come together like this. That's the encouragement that Jesus, our Savior, needed the night before his death. Guys, be with me. Just try to stay awake, okay? That's all I need. They didn't quite do that, but (laughs) just stay awake and pray. When we gather together in this way, we can be encouraged in that way. By the faith of others, when the faith of of our own, you know, can't hold us up. So to bring it full circle, why do we gather together for corporate worship? Why is it important to climb the mountain sometimes? First, to bring God glory, hopefully in big ways, knowing that when we get a glimpse of who God really is, we can't walk away from that unchanged. When we really encounter God, it forms us, encourages us, it it makes over who we are. We're called to this lifestyle of worship to daily ascribe worth to God in everything we do. And it's important that we regularly come here and do this. It it can recontextualize everything else, I hope. On a a Wednesday evening in April, uh, 1968, I think, maybe 69, um, in Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. ended what would become one of his most famous speeches um, by reflecting on his own mortality. He had been the victim of, of threats on his life for years, and, and people say that in this night he was especially just kind of caught up in thinking about that. Uh, and he ends this very famous speech by alluding to uh, Moses, who led the people all the way to, to the edge of the promised land, but was not going to go in with them. And so God brings him up on the mountaintop, and he says, look out over this promised land. Your people will get there. You will not. And he alludes to this, and watch this clip. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over 
And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. King was assassinated the following afternoon. (laughs) That would be the last speech he gave. Those would be the last public words that people would hear from him. Those close to him the night before said he was just beside himself. He was overcome. He was overwhelmed. You can see it at the end there. He could barely get to his seat on his own. You can kind of see him working it out in his face as he preaches this. He senses something's coming. But even as he speaks, you can hear him make peace with it. And as I watch that, I ask myself, why? How? How can this man reflect on his own mortality? How can he say that? What is the basis for this hope? How can he preach this? He looks like he's looking past them, looking to what's coming for him. He says so. He can do it because he's been to the mountaintop. He's seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has experienced something in his relationship with God at some point that opened his mind to something bigger, to the bigger picture, to knowing and trusting who God was. I I don't know what was going through him, but he had seen the promised land, and it filled him with hope. Being on that mountaintop, even for a moment, enabled him to descend back into the valley and face his own death long before many of his goals would be achieved. I started today talking about the disciples on the mountain with Jesus, seeing Jesus transformed and glorious before their eyes, a vision of who Jesus truly is, right? And I wonder, in the dark days following Jesus' death, did that memory come back to them? That's what I wonder. Did they remember what they saw on the mountain? In the midst of this valley, in the midst of darkness and struggles of life, did they remember the glory they saw? Did they say, I don't feel that way now, but I remember the mountaintop. Praise God for that. Did they remember? What we experience on the mountaintop changes how we live in the valley changes what we see and ground our faith when we have no reason for faith around us in the present. My prayer coming out of this message this morning is that we would just approach this in a new light. All of us, the people here, everyone. That we would approach what's happening here on a Sunday differently. And we're going to begin to do that by, by celebrating communion today. So in a moment, the ushers are going to come by with a tray of bread and a tray of juice. Um, you're welcome to take that when you feel ready. However, um, our practice here is that as long as you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you are welcome to take part in this. Um, you don't have to be a member of the, of the church or anything. If, you, if you're not a follower of Jesus or you don't feel comfortable doing this, that's totally fine. Just pass it down the, la- down the way, okay? Um, when you receive these, take them whenever you feel ready. As we take part in communion today, we remember these mountaintops. We, 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 the act of doing this is celebrating and remembering and making a big deal out, out of the greatest act of love that anyone has ever displayed. The sacrifice of the innocent Jesus for the guilty us. As we do this, We confidently trust in God's promise that he will be with us, that he is with us. As we symbolically partake in his body and his blood, we know that we can and we will encounter his spirit of comfort today. We proclaim and we celebrate, we remember his death, knowing that he is alive and well and coming again soon. Amen? As we do this together, we know that Jesus is forming us into a body. Communion has always been communal. And even as we are united with Jesus by doing this, we are united with each other as we do this. And as we do this, we find encouragement. 
This is just an amazing thing in knowing that Jesus took on flesh and blood, walked through dark valleys so he could save us and could identify with us in our sufferings. Did you know that? In Hebrews chapter 2, it tells us that part of Jesus' motivation in coming as flesh and blood is though so that he could appropriately comfort us in our sufferings. He would know what it's like to walk in our shoes. So as we celebrate that the God of the universe became flesh and blood, we can remember that and take deep, deep comfort. Ushers, I invite you forward as we administer the communion elements and as we worship God and bring him glory through the celebration of communion.